All right, so one of the, the most famous tragedies in modern history was the sinking of a British luxury passenger liner in April of 1912. This ship was known as the Titanic. Uh, it was just a few days into its maiden voyage en route to New York City from Southampton, England. It was a technological marvel. It boasted the greatest amenities of any ship ever created. Upon sailing, uh, it was one of the largest and most opulent ships in the world. Most impressive, though, was its safety feature. It had 16 uh, compartments that included doors that could be closed from the bridge so that water could be contained in the event that the hull was breached. The ship's boulders claimed that, uh, boulders, the ship's builders claimed that four of the compartments could be flooded without endangering the ship's buoyancy. And so this led many uh, to claim that the ship was unsinkable. Uh, one of the crew members, uh, when asked about the ship's safety, famously said that even God can't sink this ship. Danger, danger. <clears throat> and then, just a few days into the trip, the ship struck an iceberg it broke apart and sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, taking with it the lives of over 1,500 people. In 1997, director James Cameron released a movie about this ship that grossed over $2.2 billion in box office sales. And when he was interviewed about the experience, he described the Titanic as a metaphor of life. And this is what he said. I want you guys to hear what he said about this. He said, we are all living on the Titanic. We're in the second week of a new summer series we began last week called Runaway Believers. Uh, last week, I told you that the book of Jonah is about sin and grace, that, uh, that if sin can be defined as running away from God, a good definition of grace is God's effort to pursue and intersect self-destructive behavior. That we are all like Jonah. And if you want a relationship with God, you must see yourself as a fugitive. We have all run from God. We are all running from God. It is in our nature to run from God. And once we see that, we can better understand God's work in our lives. All right, so this is a, a short book. You can literally read it in like eight minutes. All right, you can read it in eight minutes, but we are committed to spending eight weeks preaching through it this summer. And so along with preaching through this book, we invite you to study it with us. Um, as you came in today, you should have received a handout. Everyone get a handout as you came in today? Okay, you should have received a handout. Uh, and this uh, handout will allow you to take notes on this message and it also includes questions for you to use to just grapple with this book as you study it uh, this summer on your own and in groups. And so we encourage you to grab a few people and study this together. I cannot emphasize enough the depth of knowledge that comes with studying scripture in community. All right, I got together with a group this week and we studied the, the first study and it was the funniest, but most challenging, convicting, it was everything. We had all the emotions active in our, in our time together studying uh, the first part of the book of Jonah. So uh, grab a few folks and do this uh, in a group. Uh, it'll be a, a blessing to you. It'll be a blessing. Uh, we also have a, a soundtrack available for the series. So if you, like, if you really want to catch the summer vibe with us, all right, you can scan the Spotify code if you have Spotify. Um, also, you can uh, go uh, onto YouTube. Uh, you can go on, I believe our site and our socials will give you a link to YouTube. Um, we created it there as well for you. So you have songs to listen to that will remind you of this, this series. So you're welcome. All right. It's good for you. All right. So again, we call this study through the book of Jonah, Runaway Believers, because in every chapter of this book, we see Jonah running in every chapter. Um, uh, one of the ways that you can look at this book and break it down is to see that Jonah chapter 1, Jonah runs from God. In Jonah chapter 2, Jonah runs to God. In Jonah chapter 3, Jonah runs with God. And in Jonah chapter 4, Jonah runs ahead of God. Uh, another way to, to look at the story, and, and many people who have studied it before us, they've concluded that the book of Jonah is like the Old Testament version of the prodigal son story. That in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells this parable about two lost sons, that the, the younger son goes to his father and he demands his inheritance right away. 
He takes this inheritance and he rebelliously runs off and wastes it before coming uh, home empty handed to repent. Then you also see this older son who doesn't run away, but his heart is just as cold as he has no love for his rebellious little brother. And he despises his father for taking his little brother back. And so as we as we study the book of Jonah, what we're going to see as we get further into it is that Jonah actually plays the part of both the younger brother and the older brother in the prodigal son story. That in chapter one and chapter two of the book of Jonah, Jonah represents the rebellious younger brother that runs away and repents. And in Jonah chapter three and chapter four, Jonah is the self-righteous older brother that God finishes the story appealing to. So last week, we made it to verse four of chapter one. All right, so I have a heavy lift today. All right, so I got to get us from verse five to verse 17 of chapter one. I got to get Jonah from this boat that's going crazy into the belly of a fish. All right, so pray for me. All right, right, this is uh, dripping, dripping with insight. I got so messed up getting ready to preach this to you guys today. So I hope it helps. All right, so now if you remember uh, last week when we were together um, in the part that we talked about last week, The Lord calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach against it. Jonah runs in the opposite direction and he gets on a ship headed to Tarshish. God chases him down and sends a storm that endangers the lives of everyone on the ship. It is the Titanic, okay? It is going down this ship. All right, so today, what I wanna do is I wanna look at Jonah and his relationship to and his impact on the sailors and their impact on him, all right? And so, uh, there's so many subplots, like you can read through the story and miss a lot, but, but there's one subplot that I just want to make mention of right now because I think it's significant, uh, that there's, there's irony in this moment with Jonah uh, in that Jonah is running away from the call of God, right? He's running away uh, from Nineveh because he doesn't want to preach to heathens, right? He's proud of his national pedigree. He only wants to serve the interests of his own nation, So he's running away from heathens. He flees from heathens only to be surrounded by heathens. The the, the whole idea for Jonah is to get as far away from dirty pagans as possible, and he ends up sacrificing his life for (coughs) dirty pagans. That's what's happening here. So this message is called Saints and Sailors because as we go through this passage, like I was saying earlier, we're going to be able to contrast the beliefs, the behavior, the character of Jonah and the sailors, right? And we're gonna be able to see how unbelievers and believers react to a storm side by side, amen? So starting in verse four, it says, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So again, God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach against it. Jonah runs in the opposite direction. He jumps on a ship headed to Tarshish. The Lord sends a storm so violent that it's beginning to sink the ship. All right. Now, let's start by just looking at how the sailors respond initially. What are the sailors' initial response to what's going on here? There's three things that I want you to see. The first thing I want you to see is that they cry out. The sailors cry out. It's very unlikely that every one of these sailors was equally religious, but in extreme conditions, they all got religious. See, Paul tells us this in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. Uh, Basically, in Romans 1, Paul tells us that our need for worship and our belief in the divine may sleep very deep, but extreme circumstances and conditions always brings it out, right? And when this happens, we see that we need God, and we cry out to whatever God we've got. That's what we do. Every human being has deep spiritual longings. If you don't believe me, go to a professional sports event. All right, you spend all this money. That, so Amy and I, we, did, we went to a Warriors game this, this year. Awful. And I love the Warriors, awful. The parking was unbelievable. The walk to the building after we paid that much for parking was unbelievable. The ticket to get in, unbelievable. For, we, I mean, we were like in nosebleeds, and we paid way too much money, and the food was way too expensive. I went home so mad, <laughs> right? But you spend all this money, 
right? You, you, you paint your face, you buy all the merch, right? Because you've got to wear their stuff too, right? right? And you start to cry out when they do something well, and you cry out when they do something bad. Uh, just this year, actually in January, there was an NFL playoff game. It was the, the Kansas City Chiefs versus the Dolphins, and it was in Kansas. And the temperature of the game, or, or, uh, the temperature going into that game was four degrees below zero, with a wind chill of 26 degrees below zero. They still sold out that game. Not only did they sell out that game, but a local hospital afterwards reported that many people that went to that game came in and they were diagnosed with frostbite and they had to get fingers and toes amputated. If that's not worship, I don't know what worship is. Go to a concert, you'll see worship. Go to a political rally, if it's not too soon, you'll see worship. You'll see worship. We all have deep spiritual longings, and we will worship something. We all cry out to God's. Secondly, it says, not only did they cry out, but they cried out to their gods in fear. See, all of our religions, unless the Holy Spirit has come and renewed your heart, unless you've actually found the one true God through faith in Jesus Christ, all of our religions are essentially religions of fear. These men cried out in fear, not in faith, not in confident hope, fear. Why fear? Because fear is the only thing that a fake God can use to control and motivate you. Idolatry makes you a person of fear because you can never do enough to appease a fake God. When things are good, idols look the part, don't they? When things are good, idols are, they seem like God. I mean, they just seem like they, they check the box. But in crisis, if you fail an idol, it'll never forgive you. And in crisis, if you're looking for your idol, it'll never fulfill you. These men are realizing in real time, as their lives are in danger, that their gods are nowhere to be found. They're crying out to their gods, and they're nowhere to be found. Can you relate? Can you relate? That which you ultimately trust in when all is well, if it's not Jesus, is of no help to you when your life is going through hell. Look what else they do. So they cry out. They cry out in fear. Then they begin to throw cargo into the sea. They begin to throw cargo into the sea. Now, the cargo is the whole point of the voyage for the sailors. It's the whole reason why they went was for the cargo. The cargo is the reason the ship has set sail. It's likely the reason the ship was built. It's likely what established the goals and the objectives of the ship in the first place. But when things get shaky, when lives are at risk, the cargo it's too heavy to carry and it's not worth keeping, which is to say this to us, that when our ships are sinking, our priorities get clarified. And so the sailors are freaking out. They're crying out. They're crying out to their gods in fear. They're throwing cargo overboard. But what's Jonah doing? Let's look at what Jonah's doing. Verse 5, the rest of verse 5 says, But Jonah had gone below deck, and he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. That sucker. <laughs> he just went to sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. The, the sailors are freaking out while Jonah is below deck asleep. Jonah is oblivious to everything that his sin is doing to everyone else. And so Jonah shows us two things here, all right? And so although the sailors, they cry out, they cry out in fear to their gods, they're throwing cargo overboard, Jonah shows us two things, and the first is this. Jonah shows us that self-absorption makes you blind to how much people have to put up with your ship. Oh, Let me say it again, <laughs> lest I be confused. 
self-absorption makes you blind to how much people have to put up with your Okay. What am I saying here? What I'm saying is there are other people in our boats that suffer when we fall asleep at the will. Our leisure can lull us to sleep so that we fumble the more important things that God has asked us to steward. This has always been seen as a demonic strategy that saints do well to be aware of, and it's this, that if Satan can't stop you from doing the will of God, he will do all he can to make you busy by appealing to your comforts. John, I want to sleep. I mean, don't you understand that the enjoyment of your comforts can be one of the biggest enemies to your calling? Be careful of what you allow your heart to be captivated by. Be vigilant about what you spend your time enthralled and entertained with. And here's the reason why. You never sin on an island. Sin always happens on a sinking ship. It always happens on a sinking ship. Many of us think that when we sin, it's private. No one knows. No one will see. But your sin is always happening on a sinking ship, and there are always people who are being impacted by it. So he shows us that. Secondly, Jonah shows us that we deserve to be rebuked when we don't use our faith for public good. We deserve to be rebuked when we don't use our faith for public good. The captain of the ship confronts Jonah while he's sleeping. The captain says, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. In other words, what he's saying is, I, I understand you're religious. Right? Right? Why are you sleeping? Don't you see the type of situation we're in? If you're religious, if you have a God, why aren't you getting your faith out and use it, using it for some public good? Don't just sit there. Do something. That's what he's saying to him. And so the two things that Jonah is guilty of here, the church tends to be guilty of. And this is what the church tends to be guilty of. And we have to own this. The church tends to be guilty of not knowing the world's problems and not caring enough to do anything about the world's problems. See, if you, if you wonder why our church, the Rock of Roseville, exists in Old Roseville at the gates of the city, it's not because this was just a really nice place to plant a church. If you wonder why we own a building, and it's not this building, it's actually a building that's literally embedded in the neighborhood down the street. Okay? We own this building off of Bonita Street, which has always been a place for the community to gather. Um, our Bonita building has been a church, it's been a school, it's been a theater, right? it's been a place to worship. It's hosted prophetic voices like Kathy Coleman and Brother Yoon. Uh, it, it's been a place to learn, it's been a place that entertains and inspires. I don't think it's any different today. I believe the purposes are still the same. If you wonder why our Bonita building is an absolute albatross, Josephine knows. We're working on it right now. It, it is just a big blob of what in the world. Okay. If you wonder why, why it's this very unattractive building, it sticks out like a sore thumb while being on a street called Bonita, which means beautiful. I don't think that's odd. I think it's God, actually. All right, if you wonder why, it is that when other churches in the area want to do outreach and ministry to the poor, they call us. It could be because God has planted this church in an area of Placer County with the lowest median home value, the lowest number of businesses, and the lowest median household income, but with one of the higher expected uh, population growth rates. We are not here to be just another church of many in Roseville. That's not who we are. We are to be a beacon of light and hope to this community. We cannot be asleep. We can't be asleep. We have to know the problems and do something about it. And so this captain was right to rebuke Jonah and the world is right to rebuke the church and reject as false any church that sleeps on the problems, the real problems that are happening in the real world. One of my favorite quotes is from Archbishop 
uh, William Temple, and he says this. He says, the church is the only institution that exists primarily for the benefit of those who are not its members. See, the moment the church becomes about the things that would make it a religious country club, I'm telling you guys, the moment you guys start giving me problems about the color of our carpet and the kind of instruments on stage, I'm going to be at your neck. That's not what this is about. Right? The world has a right to reject a church like that. All right. So moving on. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. These are seasoned, experienced sailors. They are so good at their job that as they are on this ship and it's sailing, the weather is so bad, they're saying, okay, this is not normal. This is supernatural. And so they start trying to look around and figure out, okay, whose fault is this, right? And somehow they're able, to, they're, they're able to isolate Jonah, and they know that Jonah's the culprit. And so they tell him to identify himself. And I want you guys to see what he starts with. Because Jonah starts with all the questions they asked him. Jonah starts with his race. He says, I'm a Hebrew. Uh, one scholar uh, said it this way. He said, since Jonah identifies himself first ethnically, then religiously, we may infer that his ethnicity is foremost in his identity. Jonah had faith in God, but it doesn't appear to be as deep and fundamental to his identity as his race and nationality. Listen, this is why when loyalty to his people and loyalty to the word of the Lord seems to be in conflict, he chooses to support his nation's interests over taking God's love and message to a new country. All right. Listen, it's unfortunate, but many Christians have the same attitude. Many of us do. For some of us, our relationship with God has not gone deep enough into our hearts. And so like Jonah, God and his love is not the, 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 the most foundational layer of our identity. All right. Let me, let me say it this way. I'll say it this way. You may sincerely believe that Jesus died for your sins, but at a subconscious and functional level, your significance, your security, other things in your life can be, uh, you can be far more grounded in your career, you can be far more grounded in your financial worth and your political leaning than in the love of God. Tim Keller says this in his book, Prodigal Prophet. He says, shallow Christian identities, I love that phrase, by the way. Shallow Christian identities explain why professing Christians can be racists and greedy materialists, addicted to beauty and pleasure or filled with anxiety and prone to overwork. All this comes because it is not Christ's love, but the world's power, approval, comfort, and control that are the real roots of our self-identity. Jonah has made the titanic mistake of compartmentalizing his race and national interests, and it clashes with the God of the very nation he says he represents. And he finds himself in a sinking ship being less faithful and, and, and less uh, just than the type of people he thinks he's better than. Listen, we got to get over this complex that we have as believers. You've been a believer for a while. I think you know what I'm talking about. You give your life to Jesus, and you come in messed up. And I mean, some of y'all were messed up, messed up. So was I. So was I. But you come in, and your life was messed up. And then God begins to sanctify you. He begins to clean you up. And now you're not doing the things you used to do. And now you're not going to the places you used to go. And now you're not saying the things you used to say. And now you're not watching the things you used to watch. Right? Your attitudes are changed. All this stuff is starting to happen. 
You begin to see life with a completely different lens. And somewhere in there, we just become self-righteous. And, it, and listen, it happens to, to all of us. You just become self-righteous. And the temptation is to look at other people who are in process just like you are in process. The temptation is to look at other people and say, hot mess express. I, um, for a while, I worked with a friend of mine who, and if he heard me say this, he would vouch for this as well, but, um, but he's an atheist. And he's the sweetest man in the world, but he's an atheist. And the nature of our position is we, we basically had the same exact position. We were both managers. And so I just worked really closely with him. And we just both kind of saw life through two different lenses. But what I learned in my time of working with him is that in so many areas, can I just tell you guys, he was a much better man than me. I just, I just knew it. I'm a believer, he's not a believer, but I just, I was involved enough in his life, I had enough respect for the common grace that God bestows upon all humanity that I was able to just watch his life and say, man, he's better than me there. He's better than me there. And I would tell him that too. We gotta get better at this. And so this, this terrified them and they asked, what have you done? This is verse 10. What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. All right now, in verse 12, we get a very different version of Jonah that emerges, right? In verse five, he's asleep. He doesn't know what's going on, doesn't care about what's going on. But in verse 12, he's ready to give his life for these sailors, right? Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Now, I love, so I was just telling you guys about this idea of common grace, of people who are not walking with Jesus, who tend to exemplify better character traits than us. We see this right here. That, that I, I love how they did not assume that even though they knew that this sinking ship was Jonah's fault, they didn't assume that now they had the right to harm him. And so they ask him questions. What, what do we need to do to you so that this stops? He says, oh, you need to kill me. You need to throw me overboard. And they're like, uh, we're going to try to row you back to land. I love that about them. Verse 14, then they cried out to the Lord, they cried out to the Lord. I, I want you to notice this too. This is a really important thing. Um, Jonah, to this point, Jonah has not prayed yet. This is the believer. Jonah has not prayed yet. He was asked to pray when the captain woke him up. He didn't pray. He gets up. He's walking around this boat. He sees the boats going down. The sailors are freaking out. They're crying out. They're crying out in fear. They're throwing stuff overboard. Still doesn't pray. And then what we see here in verse 14 is that the sailors begin to pray to his God before he does. It says, they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. See, as much as we can contrast the saint and the sailors, the prophet and the pagans in this story, uh, the prayer of the sailors shows us what they all have in common. So I just want to break that down here, and we're going we're gonna to wrap up here. So our, our worship team, you guys can come back. Um, but follow me on this. I, I'm like, this is insight that I'm still trying to get my, my mind around. So let me see if I can help us with this. Look at the sailors here. At first... They are crying out in fear to their gods, right? And then once they find out that it's Jonah's God that's in control, they begin to cry out to him, but they're still in fear, right? 
They say things like, please don't kill us for taking this man's life. Please don't hold us accountable for we're only doing what we think you want us to do. Right? They're not talking to a God they trust. They are not speaking in their minds to a heavenly father. Right? They have no confidence that the gods that they serve love them, so they project this onto the God of Jonah. This is how they are like Jonah, and this is how we are all alike. And it's this, right? That the natural bent of the human heart is to know that there is a God, but to not trust him. The natural bent of the human heart is to know that there is a God, but to not trust him. I heard a story of a hospital chaplain uh, who was um, called to um, a bedside at three in the morning. So they woke him up at three in the morning. There was a gentleman in the room who was freaking out. He was freaking out. He got a diagnosis that he had terminal cancer. They took his x-ray, terminal cancer, and so he wanted to talk to someone about God. So he was freaking out, got this chaplain to come to the room, and as the chaplain came to the room, the man was embarrassed. He said, man, I'm sorry to bother you, but there's been a mix-up. They took my x-rays and another man's x-rays, and they thought I was the one who had terminal cancer but it was just a mix up, I don't have terminal cancer. And I'm not a religious person, so I'm sorry that I bothered you. And what this man was saying was, I will deal with God if I have to, but only if I have to. And now that I'm okay, have a great day. This is how we deal, right, with the boss we don't like, right? You don't, like, your boss isn't here, I don't think, so you can, it's okay. Right? This, this is how you deal with someone in your life that has authority over you, but that you don't particularly care for or trust. Right? I will deal with him if I have to, but I don't trust him. See, praying in fear is not a sign of grace in your heart. Praying in fear is not a sign of grace in your heart. Right? I was thinking about this this week. Right? We have many examples culturally of this. I'll give you two. Right? Because I grew up on hip-hop, I'll give you two hip-hop people. Kanye West and P. Diddy. All right. Kanye West, a few years ago, really committed to his faith. He released a gospel album. He really cleaned up his life. He was trying to save his marriage. But in a recent album, an album he released this year, he called himself the new Jesus, which is actually not inconsistent with things he said in the past. Right. But he calls himself the new Jesus. And in interviews since he released his album, he talks about unanswered prayer, he talks about being let down by God, and, and this is my read on what's going on with him, is that it seems as though his prayers were more about his fear of his marriage not working out, and when it didn't, neither did his relationship with God. Yep. Right. I Many of you guys are aware of the P. Diddy saga. Um, he recently um, released a, an apology video in response to another video that came out about um, abuse of a former girlfriend. And P. Diddy, having been very vocal about his non-relationship with God, in his private conversations with his closest friends, everyone knows that is not a man of God. That is not someone who worships Jesus. Although that's the case and everyone knows it, he releases this video saying how he wants God's forgiveness, how, um, how he's looking for the grace of God. It's all that God language in his video. Praying in fear is not a sign of grace in your heart. It's, it's not. The natural response of every human heart is to pray in extreme conditions. It is. Whenever you're in deep crisis, your natural reli religiosity will come to the surface, and if you begin to bargain and negotiate with God instead of trusting and surrendering to him, you do so because you don't believe he loves you. That was a mouthful, I'm gonna say it again. Whenever you're in deep crisis, your natural religiosity will come to the surface. And if you begin to bargain and negotiate with God instead of trusting and surrendering to him, you do so because you don't believe he loves you. Until you actually find God through faith in Jesus Christ, your heart wants to bargain when you're in trouble. A lot of us can admit that you only get religious when you're in trouble, and therefore that's actually evidence that you don't trust God. 
right? You're like the sailors. Many of us can remember times in our lives when we've had trouble and looking back on it. Now, looking back on some of the stuff that happened to you, you say, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal, but in the time it was, right? In the time you literally thought you were on a sinking ship and there was a storm that's gonna take you out. And in that moment, when that was happening to you, you bargained, right? You said something like what I've said in the past, which is, God, if you save me from this, I will give you my life. Have you done that before? God, if you save me, I'll, 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 I'll give you my life. That is the prayer of fear. That, that's bargaining. It's dealing with a God that you don't trust. Amen. One other uh, thing I want to I wanna say to you about this, um, as I was thinking about it, the other ironic part of the prayer of fear is that um, it says, Lord, I'm in a jam. I'm in a jam. I, I'll do anything if you help me. Yet the one thing God wants, we won't give him. The one thing God wants is for us to come to him without conditions and trust him and say, I'm going to obey you no matter what the conditions are. The one thing God wants is for us to stop bargaining with him out of fear and mistrust. And it typically is the thing that we don't want to give him, which is our full surrender. Amen. In their prayer to Jonah's God, the sailors show us that we are all in the same boat. Us, Jonah, the sailors. It's the natural reflex of the human heart to cry out to God in trouble, but doing so in fear is not the only option. It's not. Finishing up here, verse 15. Then they, looked, they, then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The sailors are miraculously delivered, and they commit their lives to the God of Israel. And even Jonah is saved by a fish God appointed to swallow him. And so the sailors are saved, Jonah is saved, is saved. And because of Jesus, we can be saved as well. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Amen. Maybe you're saying, man, Sean, you just threw Jesus in there kind of slickly. Where do you get that from? Uh, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, there's this story about Jesus on a boat with his disciples that plays out almost identically to the story of Jonah. That if you pull up Jonah chapter 1 and you compare it to Mark chapter 4, almost identical stories of what you'll see. You'll see that both Jesus and Jonah were in a boat and both boats were overtaken by a storm. You'll see that both Jesus and Jonah were asleep. In both stories, the sailors woke up the sleeper and said, we're going to die. In both stories, there was miraculous intervention and the sea was calmed. And in both stories, the sailors at the end became more terrified than they were before the storm came. Two almost identical stories, but there's just one difference. And here's the difference. In Jonah's storm, he told the sailors, there's only one thing you can do. If I perish, you live. If I die, you survive. And they threw him into the sea. That doesn't happen in Mark chapter 4. That doesn't happen in Jesus' story. Or does it? See, so if you zoom out and you see the rest of Jesus' story, you'll see that in the book of Matthew, Jesus refers to himself as the true Jonah. And what he ultimately meant by that was someday I'm going to calm all storms. I'm going to still all waves. One day I'm going to destroy destruction. I'm going to break brokenness. I'm going to kill death. How does he do that? The cross. On the cross, Jesus was thrown willingly like Jonah into the ultimate storm, under the ultimate waves, the waves of sin and death. 
Jesus was thrown into the only storm that can actually sink us. Jesus was thrown into the storm of eternal justice, which is all we owe for our wrongdoing. That storm wasn't calm until Jesus was swept away in it. And so we're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, it's important for me to reemphasize that we are all living on the Titanic. You can rearrange the furniture all you want. It's going down. Uh, if, you've, if you've watched the movie, if you've gotten through the three hours, God bless you. But if you've watched the movie, one of the things that I always found funny when I've seen the movie is that as they know the ship is sinking, they send the orchestra out to entertain the people. Right, which is to say this, don't let the orchestra that the world will bring out distract you from reality, All right? Don't wait for extreme conditions to cry out. Cry out to God now. D don't wait for your idols to let you down. Turn to God now. Cast off your shallow Christian identities because they're doing nothing for you. That they're cargo that gets thrown overboard when life gets hard. Right? Don't make the Titanic mistake. Don't assume that your life is unsinkable. Don't do that. Do you know that uh, for decades it was assumed that the reason why the Titanic sank was because they thought that five of the compartments failed after they boasted about four being able to fail without it sinking. And what they found when they found when they were able to get to the ship in 1985, what they discovered is that only one compartment was damaged and that was enough to affect the rest. What does that mean, Sean? If you're here today and you think you can divide your life into compartments and what you do in one area doesn't affect the rest, I'm here to tell you today that sin in any one area of your life is enough to sink you. Yeah, but if you will give your life to Jesus right now, he will change you from the inside out. He will transform every compartment of your life and you will never be the same. And so with all heads bowed, all eyes closed. We looked at a story today full of unbelieving sailors and a believer that was struggling. So I just wonder if today we have a room full of the same. If you're here today and you would say, Sean, I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've been running from God. But I want to say yes to his grace. If it's true that grace is God's effort to intercept my self-destructive behavior, I want to be rescued today. If you're here and that is your heartbeat, that's what you want the next step is just to raise your hand. And we're not going to embarrass you. We just want to pray for you. If you're here today, you say, Sean, I want to give my life to Jesus. I see you. I see you. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. Step up your hand. Listen, it does not matter what you have done. It does not matter what you've done in the past. You may have walked in here today and you did the most shameful thing before you came in here. That may be you. But if you turn to God right now, if you repent right now, God will remember the pivot. He will remember you turning. And as far as the east is from the west, he will cast all the things you've done. But you got to say yes to him now. It's my last call. Just raise your hand. I see you, buddy. I see you, brother. You're a believer. You're here today. You're, you're like, all right, Sean, I, I've been walking with Jesus for a while, but man, I'm on the struggle bus. I, I understand this Titanic analogy. I've been running from God, and I find myself on sinking ships constantly, and I'm tired of running. You would say that as a believer. 
by raising your hand right now, that's you testifying to God that I'm done running and I'm coming back to you. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you as well. Amen. Amen. As our prayer team comes up, I just want to pray for you all. Lord, we give ourselves to you afresh today. It's a humbling thing to see ourselves as people who are constantly running away from you. But I thank you, like I said last week, that you have more grace to give than we have sins to commit. Thank you, God, that you were just as committed to Jonah in this story as you were committed to the sailors. That you're just as committed to believers, getting it right, getting you right, than the places that you ask them to go preach to. God, would you fill our hearts afresh? There are those in this room who maybe for the first time are saying yes to you. And God, I ask that, that you, would, you would begin to testify by your spirit that they are yours and you are theirs that you would forgive them for their sins, that you would cleanse them of all unrighteousness. And with their truly repentant heart, God, would you just wash them new? One of the most amazing things I can remember when I first became a believer that was just profound to me was that I would wake up every morning and I would just, I would just hear the whisper of the Lord saying, I'm still here. Lord, may you grant everyone in this room that gift and for those who've been walking with you for a while Lord but they just need a fresh encounter with you God would you graciously give that to them would you strengthen us God God we thank you for who you are we thank you for your pursuit of us teach us Lord how to walk with you all the days of our lives in Jesus name amen, amen.